Today, Jesus teaches us about glory. In our gospel text, Jesus is praying to God the Father, and his prayer centers around this theme of glory. He tells us that the Father's plan for salvation brings the Father glory. He explains that by fulfilling that plan of salvation, Jesus is also given glory. Finally, we learn that by having faith in this plan, we give glory to God, and he also gives us the gift of eternal life in his glory. But before we can talk about receiving this glory, we must recall that our glory was first lost. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In its original state, God's creation was perfect. It was glorious. However, that didn't last very long. God gave Adam and Eve one law, and they broke it. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And with that very first sin, Genesis 3 is clear that God's glorious creation was tarnished. Pain and suffering, toil and hardship entered into the world. Worst of all, death came over all creation. What was very good, pure, and glorious became bad, defiled, and tarnished. Indeed, this is the world that we see and know. In a world ruined by sin, we really don't see much glory. In fact, we use that word glory to describe an extraordinary goodness among the evil, pain, and suffering that are all too commonplace. For example, there's a 1989 movie titled Glory, about an extraordinary company of African-American soldiers who overcame the evils of racism and hatred during the Civil War. We might look back at our youth and say, those were the glory days, the years of innocence and contentment before life beat us down. Often, we attribute extraordinary acts of sacrifice and valor in the midst of the death and horrors of war as being glorious. Indeed, in our world, glory has certainly become the exception. Sin has ruined creation. It's ruined humanity and it's ruined you and me. Our sin has robbed us of the glory that God intended for us to have. I don't have to list the ways. We see it all around us. And as sinners, you and I have contributed to this degradation of what once was God's glorious creation. Yet, Genesis 3 doesn't only describe this degradation, it also expresses God's plan to restore glory to his creation. He says to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall strike his heel. It's this very plan that Jesus focuses on in our gospel text today. So, what is this glorious plan? Well, Jesus hints at it in the first few verses of our reading. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. In saying, the hour has come, Jesus is expressing that it's time to carry out the plan. Here, Jesus also explains that this plan brings glory to the Son. 
for fulfilling the plan. It brings glory to the Father for making the plan. And it also brings glory to man because he gives us eternal life. This great and glory bringing plan was one of sacrifice. God's sacrifice for us. In Romans, we're reminded the wages of sin is death. Justice needed to be met. The wages needed to be paid. For all of our sins, there must be death. But God did not want us to die. So he died in our place. Such is the great love of God. So that we would not be punished, Jesus was punished. So that we might have life, Jesus gave his life. So that we might have glory, he suffered shame. We deserve to be beaten. We deserve to be hung on a cross. We deserve to be separated from God and cast into hell. For we have sinned. We have broken God's law. But God, out of his enormous love and mercy, planned to do just the opposite. He endured what we deserve. Though he was innocent, he was beaten. Though he was innocent, he was hung on a cross. Though he was innocent, he was forsaken by God. And this was God's plan all along, that the innocent would suffer for the guilty so that the guilty might become innocent and thus have eternal life. What a loving and wonderful and glorious plan this truly is. So Jesus explains then how this plan will bring glory to the Father, to him, and to us. He says in verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He was looking ahead, looking past his suffering and his crucifixion. He knew that he would carry out the plan, that he would suffer and die, and that in so doing, he would bring the Father glory. We might compare this to a father who sends his son off to war. The son dies by jumping on a grenade in order to save his friends. Though he loses his son, the father is still brought honor and glory because of the valiant and selfless actions of his child. Jesus continues, and now father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This plan would not only bring the Father glory, it would bring the Son glory as well. Jesus is now looking beyond his death to his resurrection. Though he died, he was raised in glory. Paul writes, the Father raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Jesus is God, but he humbled himself to become man, and he further humbled himself unto death upon a cross. Yet, in carrying out God's glorious plan, he was exalted. He was glorified and restored to his heavenly throne. In the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Father and the Son receive glory. But that's not all. Jesus continues, I have manifested your name to the people 
whom you gave me out of the world. The name of God that Jesus reveals encompasses God's whole character, his great love and grace towards mankind, most clearly shown in his plan to save mankind. So Jesus revealed to us that God brings us glory also, and indeed he has. The very purpose of God's glorious plan was to restore the glory to the sin-tarnished, death-defiled human race. Jesus reveals this in verse 2. He, he says, he came to give eternal life. What could be more glorious than living forever in the presence of our glorious Father and our glorious Savior? But Jesus explains that though this glory is offered to all, not all will receive this glorious gift. He says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We only receive this glorious gift of heaven through faith. And what is faith? It is trusting in God to save us. It is believing that he really did die to forgive our sins and that he really rose to defeat death and offer eternal life. Faith is humbly admitting that we can't do it ourselves and it's knowing that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Faith then is the key to the whole plan. By having faith, we give God the glory that he deserves, and through faith, we receive the glory that he offers. By understanding that we are eternally hopeless without him, and trusting solely in God for salvation, we're giving him the credit we're giving him the glory, a glory that he surely deserves for all that he did to earn for us glory. Yet, in our humility, God exalts us. God gives us the glory of eternal life in paradise. Peter tells us this in our epistle. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. <clears throat> Isn't God's plan marvelous? Isn't it truly glorious? Though by sinning we lost the original glory with which he created us, he devised a plan that would restore glory and bring himself much deserved glory in the process. In simplistic terms, we might say it's a win-win situation. By humbling himself unto death, he forgave our sins. By rising from the dead, he defeated sin, death, and Satan. In so doing, he wins a threefold glory. The Father receives glory for selflessly sacrificing his Son. Jesus, the Son, receives the glory of victory as he is exalted to the right hand of the Father. And we receive the glory of forgiveness and eternal life in paradise. We come to understand then why Christianity revolves entirely around faith. By having faith, which is trusting in God alone for eternal life, we give God the glory of being our victorious God and Savior. In return, out of his incredible love and mercy, he gives us glory, for he grants to us the gift of living eternally in his glorious kingdom. So, 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, believe, trust in God. Put your faith in our glorious Heavenly Father. When we look inside ourselves, we see so much sin and we know intuitively that we can't earn heaven. We can't earn glory on our own. So we ask, Lord, help us to believe. Grant us this glorious faith. And having received this gift, we give God the glory that he deserves. By faith, give him this glory. By trusting in him, give him this glory. By relying solely on him, give him this glory. In prayer, in praise, in song, in word, and in deed, give God this glory. And he will give us glory. Glory be to God. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus unto eternal life.